I think I had five cameras at the peak, but most of his key is from the candles. And I just literally would just move the cake around a little bit to light people. You would move the cake to light people? <laughs> just a little bit. That's awesome. If it makes the project better, then that's, that's why we're all there. Hey, what's going on, Indiemogo? My name is Ted, and today we're here with Lockie Mill, who's the cinematographer behind the film Hunt for the Wilder People, which, if you haven't seen it, is kind of a Sundance indie darling film out there, directed by Taika Waititi. Today we're going to be talking about the cinematography of an indie film, how to work with what you got, but also how to actually cover comedy in a movie, and how to make a visual style when you're shooting in a difficult scenario where the weather is constantly changing. Let's do this. Disobedience, stealing, spitting, running away, throwing rocks, kicking stuff, loitering, and graffiti. There's no one else who wants you, okay? Lucky, can you tell me a little bit about the project Hunt for the Wilder People? Kind of how did this come upon in the first place? Tyka and I were really interested in doing a dramatic project. That was the next thing that he had in the works after what we do in the shadows. It came around very quickly. It was a quick shoot. It was a 25 day shoot, zero sets. Everything was location with the exception of we built the barn at Hex Place for obvious reasons that you see later on in the film. We were scouting locations while we were shooting. We shot it towards the middle of winter in the North Island of New Zealand, which is the weather's very difficult at the best of times anyway. And one of those situations where you kind of capture lightning at a bottle with the people that you get, you know, the people that liked Tyke were familiar with his work had history with him that were happy to come on board at short notice for a crazy location road movie running around in the jungle for five weeks or whatever it was. So that was great. As far as the visual style, how did you guys find the actual look for the film too? And what were the things that were going through your head? Taika came with a few kind of, you know, Peter Weir references, particularly um, with the audio, uh, with the music, the sound design, but also things like in-camera zooms, which might not necessarily be something that you ordinarily knee-jerk gravitate towards, but there was a real nostalgia that he wanted to bring to the, how we would shoot the film, you know, so it would, it would lend itself to some of the genre films of, say, the mid-80s, particularly Peter Weir's kind of work, you know, where you didn't have cranes necessarily, so you'd do a zoom if you wanted to go into somebody's face. Trying to do as much stuff in camera as possible. You know, when you're in the mid-1980s, you didn't necessarily have the luxury of, that we do now, obviously with visual effects and compositing and et cetera, all the rest of it. What kind of preparation goes into it, especially because you have the seasons going on in New Zealand too. How do the seasons and the weather affect the production? And how do you prepare and plan and be able to shoot something like that, especially when the odds are so stacked against you in the first place? We kind of all went into it with open arms, kind of saying that the environment that we get is the environment that we get. I guess the case in point of that is the first day we went to shoot the car chase scene, which was the beginning of week two. And it was not supposed to snow, but it snowed the very first day that we were there. And we were, we were day one of five for the car chase. If we start shooting, it's not going to match. So what do we do? And essentially all the snow work you see in that film was on one day in one location that managed to serve two or three different places to make it feel like they'd travel more distance. But that was also one of the great things of that film because I was really keen on trying to show the passage of time. We only had 25 days to do it. So I wanted to be able to use that as much as possible. And we were really lucky that it snowed. So it felt like they were out there for a lot longer rather than just walking through bush and occasionally a little bit of rain. It felt like it was more, much more seasonal for them. Play the cards you dealt um, and you do the best you can. All right, well, let's do this. Let's jump into a couple of scenes and mm. start off. Ready? Yeah. Baker, now you are 13 years old. So, Lucky, what is uh, going on in this scene right now? I think this is where Ricky Baker is having his first ever birthday party. This was one of the great improvised moments of the film. Because Rima could play the keyboard. Rima, who's playing Bella, she could play the keyboard. She just starts bashing out the song. And it literally, we're just kind of everybody's just sitting there throwing in words. I think mostly it was Sam and Tyka who ended up coming up with the lyrics. Feels like something that everybody had been sitting there rehearsing for, for years, but it was, a lot of it was just stumbled through on the day. That's crazy. I know, it's cool, right? In this moment, I guess, as a cinematographer, what did you know that you would need to be portrayed? I knew that something was gonna happen that nobody had necessarily planned for. So from a lighting and a composition side of things, I wanted to keep it as simple as possible. Like that frame there, I really like that wide frame there because it's so symmetrical and it, kind of we try and make it feel a little bit like it's the end of the day it's super simple how was this set up as far as actual lighting this project too this was just um a bulb over the top of the table that i then i think i put a pancake over the top of it or something something soft just to try and um, amplify what was already happening there and then dimmed it down and warmed it up a little bit same with the pracs there um, i just dressed them into shot and dimmed them down so that they weren't actually lighting too much of the background 
um, and that the sources themselves weren't overexposed. And you can yeah. just see there's just a little bit of coolness coming from the window on the um, frame left, which was just a tented practical window with a sheer curtain in front of it. And um, I want to say a sky panel out there, something like that. I think that's all it was, super simple. The location, one of the, one of the reasons we chose it was how um, tonally dark the interior is there. You know, like there's a lot of wood um, fireplaces, etc. There's not white walls everywhere. So it's really easy straight away to try and keep the light off that and focus in on the people on the table, which is what we're all wanting to see. So is that light that's on his face, on Hector's face, is that actually coming from the candles? Yep. That's wild. There's a, you can see on his hair, there's a little bit of that top light, but most of his key is from the candles. And I just literally would just move the cake around a little bit to light people. You would move the cake to light people? <laughs> just a little bit. With lighting, particularly in a situation like this, I try and be as kind of honest as possible. So you yeah. talked about tinting that back window. What do you mean by that? So is there is there actually gel on that window or? There's just a 12 by black solid over the top of it, just with sides because it was bright day outside. You start with nothing and then you add to it. And then why blue? What's the reason for the tinting of the color for the outdoor light? It looks beautiful. Just so, just so it feels like it's the end of the day. You know, last light, that was the idea. You know, he's also in a in a cardigan, so and so is she. So it's, it's a getting towards the cooler time of year, which is when we shot it anyway. So I, I wanted it to feel a little colder outside. White is always good. I know Taika's editorial style is he tends to sit on shots a little bit longer. And that's where a lot of the comedy kind of comes in from the, the time where ordinarily some people might be tempted to cut. And sometimes it's the it's the emptiness and the negative in the space that can, can be where the comedy can come from. There wasn't actually that many opportunities to show what this place was like as well. And we did some, there was some great art department work that was happening in the background there. So I was interested in showing who these people were a little bit as well with this frame because there weren't going to be that many opportunities to do that so i guess it's probably those two things really god it sounds good all yeah. right let's go next scene ready yeah let's do, <laughs> let's it. do this straight up that was the most gangster shit i've ever done you idiot this is the moment just after ricky stood up and defended het for the first time really where that he was held capture captive and they were going to try and take him back into town and, and have him accountable for his actions and he's stuck up for him because he's realizing that they're actually a great team and they just, you know, they should commit to this whole Skux life thing and run away into the jungle. And this is heck kind of coming to terms with the fact that they're a team now and that they're on the run. How do you deal with daytime exterior? This is like a nightmare for a lot of people, especially in a place yeah. where seasons are changing. Like the default is always to try and go backlit as much as you possibly can. The benefit for us shooting at this time of year was it was approaching winter. So obviously the days are shorter and the arc of the sun is lower. So it's easier to put the sun behind people uh, because it's not quite so top lit. You don't necessarily get the deep eye shadows that you get in the middle of a, say, a summer's day. I'm not a huge fan of diffusing outside light very much because, again, it's like I just feel like it, like if we put an overhead over that, A, you wouldn't be able to move very much, but also I just like the honesty of that being kind of brutal, side lit. He looks the same as the background. You know, it's, it, I just didn't want it to feel too pretty, if that makes sense, too nice. Understood. So in this case, it's really kind of separating the two characters. One character that's sort of out of his element, one character that is, you know, mm -hmm. more comfortable in this scenario. So you back yep. the one that's more comfortable in the scenario, and then you have the other one struggling to be there a little bit. So Lucky, you have this kind of huge forest, though. How do you pick what area looks good in terms of the framing and where you want to place people? We wanted to feel like they'd come to an open expanse but then we're about to go back into the bush so we're really trying to tie the proximity of that to their location a little bit so it feels like they're on top of the hill but they're about to go down the other side and also i'm a, i wanted to put him not hard if he was going to be backlit i didn't want to put him hard up against the sun because the sun was almost directly above him so if you're looking into the sun but it's just slightly out of frame it can be put some of the brightest part of the sky so if i could break that up with something else i.e that um, then that would help us out a bit too. I see. So you were able to kind of break up the light, darken the actual just harshness of that sunlight a little bit by dappling it through the actual Yeah, trees just by branches. putting him against a background which isn't just 100% sky. And uh, that's a body that's a body double for him as well. So the other thing too when you shoot miners, see that shoulder there is you, you've got to you've got to think about when you block through with kids the time like they might have to go to school or you might only get them for three hours and the scene might take five hours. So how are you going to shoot it out? So there's a lot of singles. There's a lot of dirty overs there but with a body double or somebody else wearing the jacket i've done a lot of work with kids now you got, you've always got to think about that stuff literally it's you, when do we see their face let's shoot that and then move on yep and get them out yeah the you got to be smart about that you got to be really careful yeah never cease to be amazed what you can get away with in movie making Whoa. Uh -oh. 
Mars will play it to the end. What do you reckon? One thing that we were really keen on for this end scene was to be, it was kind of like an homage to like an 80s action movie. There's a few kind of Easter eggs. That's one of the guys, you, you won't notice it, but there's a very famous New Zealand commercial that he's one of the stars on. So, um, which is referencing the Barry Crump Toyota commercials, which is what the name of the car is. It was all based around a Toyota Hilux. So there's a bit of a throwback to, you know, Tiger's childhood. It's all very kind of like Kiwiana nostalgic stuff, which is pretty fun. I can't, sorry, I can't overestimate how important it is for everybody to know that when you're doing something of this kind of scale is information is so key um, because A, it can be really dangerous. B, you don't have a lot of time. C, it's really expensive to do stuff like this, particularly on a low budget indie film. So you don't have that many goes at it. So as, as, as much as you can co coordinate and choreograph on a grand scale, it's only going to make the project better. We got a bunch of model cars um, and a Canon 5D and a, and a border and table and essentially recreated the location that we'd scouted and I got my camera out and I filmed the little animatic. Here's the bit where the car, the cop car overtakes and the Hilux um, countering it. Here's where the helicopters are being. I shot it on a little animatic and then cut it together and showed it to Tiger and the producers and then we used that as a bit of a starting point. It doesn't necessarily mean this is how it's going to be, but it's a really, really quick, good shorthand to, to explain to a number of people at one time exactly what's going to happen. I stayed down on the ground and did all the long lens car chase stuff. Daryl was with Tiger up in the, in the helicopter I think the first two days was most of the car chase stuff and then we did hard mount stuff and pod work because obviously you've got a miner who not only can't drive a car, can't touch the pedals and legally isn't allowed to drive. So how do you shoot that? You know, so there's a lot of, there's oh that sim trap so nobody's yeah. moving. So there's a lot to think about. There's a lot of moving parts for this thing and a lot of stuff that you're just trying to trick people into thinking is happening when it really isn't. Gotcha. And then what are the ways that you guys actually shoot this? So I know most of the show is being shot with a single camera, but in this case, this is one of the times that you guys diverted yeah. away from that. I think I had five cameras at the peak. It was like two or oh three days gosh. where we had five cameras. Yeah, we had three XTs and two red. So we had one of those on a um, 12 to one in the chopper on a shot over, um, doing all the aerial stuff and doing the chopper to chopper work. There is, I did the, another longer lens on the ground. And then I had, I think one other handheld mobile camera that could jump between vehicles because I wanted to get a lot of kind of like first person type stuff, you know, like hands on stereo shooting past somebody in the foreground to something else through the windshield, that sort of stuff, you know, rear view mirror stuff. I like all that kind of visceral observational stuff. This was on a remote head on the back of a tracking vehicle. I did all that stuff. And so that's a great, that's this cool reveal we wanted to try. And we kind of found that on the day. We just kept bringing the, the vehicle closer and closer until it filled the frame and then got them to pull out. So you could see the reveal on the scale of everybody else that's chasing behind it. Just get as much coverage. Cause you know, editorially, it's going to be cut so quickly that one of the things you really need is a variety. You need a lot of different shots and to give it the energy to go with the music and to make it feel like it's frenetic and there's a lot of stuff going on. You just need a lot of coverage for that kind of work. To see the scale, you need to see all these things in the one shot is to go wide where you can. Like if you go any wider, it might feel like there's only a tiny bunch of cars and a huge big landscape. But if you put them right to the edge of the frame there, it feels like the whole landscape's full of vehicles, even though that's probably where all the vehicles ended. Yeah, it feels as if there's way more cars that are being cropped out on the left and the right. That's of the right. Frame. Yeah, but... we just chose not to shoot them rather than we just couldn't afford to have any more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's the key for your, for yeah. your indie giant scene is like, mm. you know, use everything we can to maximize this and then also frame use the as much of an illusion as we can in filmmaking to make this even hundred percent yeah that's exactly right yeah the big thing for me on a personal level is i wanted it to feel big i wanted it to feel a bit ridiculous in the scale in the sense that <laughs> it's just yeah. been two people in the bush walking around talking and then it cuts to this like what film is this that we're watching all of a sudden like it just changes gear like it's like, like a handbrake turn it just turns into this last boy scout action movie or something like that by the end of it <laughs> that's why i smile just looking at the frame it's fun. So funny yeah you talked a lot about finding the visual style as you went along in the project. How do you make sure that it stays consistent throughout the entire film? I guess a lot of the times the locations were quite similar. Automatically, you're already going to places that from the get-go are, are reasonably alike. We also weren't able to travel huge distances or do massive company moves just because it was a small film. We couldn't afford to do it. There was a lot of that. I also try and use the least amount of lookup tables as I can when I'm working as well just to try and not get too confused and caught up, trying to treat each scene on its own merits and say, this is gonna have a blue look and this is gonna have a, you know, like I try and do that stuff with lighting um, or times of day or scheduling or location or production design rather than 
grading it too heavily. It's, it's, it's great to have a, have a concept of how you want this thing to feel, but I think knowing what you can do on the day or what you can wait and do later on um, is really important as well. I think that's really key. You don't get bogged down, bogged down too much in technical components, if that makes sense. Like I said before, it's so subjective. There are so many different ways you can shoot anything. Um, and the way that you do it is the right way for that particular project. I think it's completely justifiable within the means that you have and the resources that you do or don't have. Alrighty, there you go, guys. There's your episode with Lockie Mill on Hunt for the Wilder People and the cinematography behind independent filmmaking and what to actually know if you're trying to work through difficult scenarios and how to actually capitalize on your biggest scenes. Now, if you want to see more works by Lockie, you can actually find them. We'll put his website in the link down below. Also, make sure to check out the podcast for which I sit down with Lockie and talk a little bit about how he went from being an independent cinematographer all the way from working and actually being the cinematographer behind shows such as Stranger Things. So we'll put that link in the description down below as well. But Andy Mogul, that's it for me. Hope you guys have an absolutely amazing day. And of course, we'll catch you guys in the next one. That's 90% outside, mostly walking and talking. And then you've got, you know, uh, a minor and um, a gentleman in his 60s who is still incredibly upwardly mobile. But there's all those kind of limitations as to logistics and all that sort of stuff. Um, Your kids and is, a dog and an, and an elderly person. I know. It's like, <laughs> it's like if you write like a what indie film should you not make book those like half of the things in the film would be on the first page like a perfect storm of that can go wrong <laughs>